Hi, uh, my name is Neil Durrant. I work at the University of Western Sydney, so thank you all for coming along to the session. I'm still recovering from uh, jet lag, so if I speak slowly, it's not because I'm Australian, it's because I uh, <laughs> have um, to recover from my trip still. So um, I work uh, at the University of Western Sydney as the Director of Performance and Quality, so you know, that means I've got the Business Intelligence Data Warehousing Unit. Uh, also, we started to have a new role in terms of um, developing new academic programs and doing the academic program planning for the university, developing a roadmap for what you know new things we might be offering and where we might offer them. Um, and also uh, inherited a uh, institutional transformation program that's uh, been running for a year and a half now. So, so that's kind of me, and uh, I, I struggle generally to explain what I'm doing. So. But you guys at least will get the BI Tableau side. So we've been using Tableau for about five years, and it just started as a, um, I just found it and thought I got to get that. So, um, and then it just started with me, and we've grown it from there so, so that the BI team has adopted it. So, um, so that's me. Uh, just a bit about the university so you know who we are. So we've got about 40,000 students, 3,000 staff. We have six campuses, five or six campuses, depending how you count them, in a sort of ring around the western uh, edge of Sydney. So to drive from our northernmost campus to our southernmost campus in the Sydney metro area is probably an hour and a half drive. So there's quite a geographic spread, but it's all within one metro area. So that creates very interesting complications for us. So I say here that we have a comprehensive academic program. That's true if you add it up across all the campuses, but it's not true of any one campus. So that creates, uh, you know, we have to think carefully about what we're offering where and why and how that's going to work. So that uh, comes into the demonstration stuff that I'll show you later. So that's, uh, that's us. Um, where we're at is in Australia. I'm not sure if any of you follow the higher ed situation in Australia. Probably not. So uh, what we're going through in the uh, environment is sort of fairly rapid deregulation of the, of the sector. So before 2012, um, everyone, the price was, was set by the government. So everyone got charged the same fee to go to university. Doesn't matter what university you went to anywhere in the country. Um, so that was, and it was a fee that you could defer on a government debt so no one had to pay up front if they uh, didn't want to. Um, that's for domestic students, obviously. International students have to pay a lot. Um, let's just cross subsidise all of that. Um, but, um, and the other thing was there was a sort of fixed quota the government would fund you for. So you had 30,000 students so at the admissions period at the start of the year. You'd sort of fill up so you got to your 30,000 and then you'd say, that's it, I'm done. So there was not really a lot of competition for students between the universities. Uh, the other thing that we have that you'll need to know for when I show you some of the demos is in New South Wales, in each state, there's a uh, central admissions body, right? So every high school student puts down nine preferences for the course they want to study, where they want to study it, and they get offered through the central body the one best eligible preference depending on how they went in high school. So that means, and we all, all universities have access to all of that data. So I know every preference of every high school student for every university in New South Wales. And I know every offer made by every university to every student in New South Wales, right? So that's a fantastic data set. So what we're in the process of is becoming more competitive, but we have access to that data, right? So that's kind of what sits behind a lot of what we're going to demonstrate. Oh, I did mention pricing. So yeah, so. Student caps, uh, the student cap was deregulated in 2012, and this year there's legislation before the parliament to uh, allow universities to set their own fees. So whether that gets through or not is all up to this one crazy independent politician who happens to hold the balance of power, um, and who happens to think university education should be free. So uh, it's a very strange situation. So it's all held up at the moment, but um, I've also had a a leading role in developing our pricing strategy, how we're going to price our product catalog. So, um, so we're in this really interesting environment where BI is kind of quite relevant. So, 
Um, what I'm going to show you is how we've tackled some of those challenges. I mean, the, the headline here is that we have to start operating more like a business. You know, we have to care about markets, we have to care about profitability. These are things that we never cared about before, right? So now we have to start caring. So uh, the things that we've done is we've uh, developed a course performance management um, dashboard in Tableau. Um, and that's, we've, you know, we've got data coming out of our ears like everybody else. So this um, dashboard is about presenting the quantitative stuff, as well as some interesting things we've done around presenting survey outcomes to our students, including um, using IBM's text analytics to parse the free comments in the surveys, and then presenting that in a visual format. Um, we've also uh, very interested in student cohort analysis, although I saw a presentation yesterday from Shawnee State University, which means we can probably throw this whole thing out and just use sets. But anyway, um, never mind. That's not quite true. Uh, so uh, yeah, we have a, um, because of where we're located, we tend to have, well, we have two thirds of our students, of our 40,000 students, their parents didn't go to university, so their first time to university. And a quarter, 25% of our student body is from a low socioeconomic status background. So we have, we have to kind of care about these cohorts and how they're tracking. And that's really well embedded in our mission and values is caring about giving access to students who otherwise wouldn't have access to university education, which makes pricing quite interesting, I have to tell you. Um, but that's, um, that's that. So we've developed this sort of custom application around Tableau to allow student cohort analysis, um, longitudinal um, studies of that. And we're also, as I said, working in this academic planning space. So we've got to think carefully about our campus locations, what we offer where. And also, I've got an exclamation mark behind market analysis because you know it's not, not something we've ever really had to do before. So that's the challenges that we faced. Um, what we've managed to do with the course performance stuff, uh, you know, it used to the, the process used to be sending out an Excel spreadsheet with 17 tabs, each tab full of data, to 70 or 80 odd directors of academic program. They're each responsible for a course or a suite of courses. And they'd have to then collect all of that information, put it into a format that was useful for them, and then write a report on the performance of their course. So you can imagine how much time that took across the organization if you add it up. So one year, I promised the next year, you're going to have all that data available for you. You won't have to collate it. So they held me to that, and we did that in Tableau. Um, the cohort tracker can't tell you much about the benefits that we've got from that yet because we're presently rolling it out and we've got a strategy around getting um, uptake of that. But really the key there, and I've heard um, yesterday a lot about this from other universities, is about understanding the impact of those intervention strategies. So I'll talk to you about how that's going to work. And then um, with academic planning, uh, we've never really had a sort of forward-looking roadmap for product development. So that's what we've got now is a five-year roadmap. And what we've done is worked really intensively with each of the deans of the schools to say, in order to put up an academic program, it can't just be that you've got a professor who loves the topic, right? You have to have evidence. So you've got to have evidence of student interest in this particular course, and you have to have evidence of employment outcomes for students. So that, and then we've broken that down into two things. Evidence in terms of maybe an emerging career that there just aren't qualifications for, and we need to think about setting up qualifications for those. But also evidence for traditional um, uh, kind of courses and the career outcomes for students. So that's um, so we're starting to see the benefits of all of that. So I'm just going to uh, give you just a quick taster of screenshots, and then we'll go into the demo. So. Um, so this is one of our, a screenshot from a course performance dashboard, and the thing you'll notice about it is that it's not very visual, right? It's numbers in a table. So I know that that's kind of anti-tableau and very boring, but there's a reason for that. The reason for that is um, we, want to, we have to take the whole organization on this journey, right? So we've got a lot of academic staff who are going to be using this. And that's the format they were used to, right? So what we were doing is taking this um, kind of Excel-based thing into a more uh, interactive visual format over time. And we made a very explicit decision that we were just going to replicate kind of the key data points in Tableau, give them some interaction. I heard a great phrase yesterday, so they can get used to the clicky-clickies of it. Um, you know, they're just not used to. 
being able to interact with stuff. They're just used to Excel spreadsheets, right? So we thought, let's not uh, go a bridge too far. Let's just go one step. So that was, um, we have kind of gradually been improving it, you'll be glad to know. But that's, um, that's why I decided to put that up as a screenshot. Um, this is where we start getting a bit more interactive and a bit more uh, exciting. So uh, we have visualized our um, survey comments using IBM's text analytics underneath. So, and I'll give you a demo of this. Um, but what you're able to do here is, uh, in this particular um, survey, there are fields for you know what um, needs improvement and what do you think is the best aspect of this course. So the comments that they've written, we've then categorized. So you can see for the general com uh, category course unit of study, 75 needs improvement comments, 72 best aspects comments. Uh, under that unit of study category, we've broken it down into other things. So it's the methods that was most commented on. And I'll show you later. You can click on the bar, and you'll get the actual comments from the survey underneath. So that's, um, that's one of the uh, where we started getting a bit visual and interactive with people, and it's had a lot of uh, success and take up. We've also uh, got this sort of overall risk indicator dashboard around our courses. So we decided on six metrics. Is it six or eight metrics? And um, we've just kind of said, you know, if you're striking out on a certain number of these metrics, then you're, uh, you're at risk, and we need to seriously think about um, what you're doing with this course. So um, I'll show you how all that works uh, a bit later on. Um, the cohort analysis stuff. So um, what we've done is created this custom application which, you know, this is kind of the stuff about uh, how many people do we have in this category and what percentage is this and, and that sort of thing. The next one, which I'll show you in the demo, shows you the academic results for those people in those different cohorts so you can sort of see how they're going academically. But the interesting thing about uh, what, that, uh, what we've done here is um, we've created this custom application. So we've defined for ourselves a set of cohorts that we know people are interested in, so low SES or age groups or that kind of thing. But we've also given people the capability to upload any set of student IDs. So if you're the counselling service um, and you've got a lot of private or sensitive information about these students, you don't, you know, you're not going to be able to come in and click on, you know, uh, these are students who've accessed counselling services because they just won't provide that information to the data warehouse. But what we have enabled them to do is to put to get a list of student IDs, a group of people, say in first semester that they have accessed counselling services, and they can, whether it's an Excel or Word or whatever, they just copy that student IDs into a into a field, upload them, and then from that point on, that becomes a custom cohort that they are able to look at over time. So they'll be able to see that group of students um, and do sort of longitudinal work with them to make sure that they're getting. So this is where we get the, uh, uh, the impact of the intervention strategy. For that group, did they start improving? Did their results improve? Did they stay at university? That sort of thing. So that's um, the cool thing that we've done there, other than just sort of doing a, a dashboard. Um, so academic planning, started to think about markets, market share, that kind of thing, and um, doing some geographic analysis around our campuses. So, I mean, rather than talk you through all the slides, uh, no, well, this one I'll stay on because I'm not going to demo this one. Um, you know, we've done this kind of generic, which I'll show you in the demo, analysis of demand for particular courses around our campuses. But we've also doing these kind of ad hoc things where, um, you know, we're thinking about setting up not campuses, but learning centres or access centres around the Sydney metro region. So we've got all these little bits and pieces. You know, my boss will say, oh, what about Westmead? Why don't we set something up there? And what about Liverpool? You know, well, let's think about there. So it's like, well, all right, what are we going to do here? So, um, so we've got a process now where we can just sort of uh, look at demand in a particular suburb for a particular um, kind of field of education or whatever. So this is something that we just did for, um, on an ad hoc basis, took maybe a half an hour to put together, which just showed, you know, this is in allied health, current school leavers, um, non-current school leavers, everyone else, and UWS, just to sort of see would we set up an access centre that had allied health 
tutors or something like that in this area? The answer is no, but they're going to do it anyway. So you can't win everything. Um, Try to tell them, you know, we've got uh, one university, that's us, has 45% of the market in Liverpool. So really it's not worth thinking about. We've got 4% in other places, but um, for political reasons, they're just going to go ahead. So go figure. BI doesn't always win. Um, and then, yeah, we've got the, dem the sort of demographic stuff. So, so that's, I just thought I'd whiz through those screenshots and I'll be demoing all of that shortly. Um, but I did want to quickly talk about um, what we're doing next. So uh, we've, uh, we've got other BI products. So we use Cognos for kind of paginated, regular kind of reporting, sending out PDFs by email. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of these kind of uh, one-off um, dashboard solutions that we've developed, which often involve emailing out a link to the dashboard and saying, why don't you go check this out? And we sort of, and we email out PDFs through Cognos, so we're kind of to the point now where everyone's going, I'm sick of all the emails, can you do something different? So, so really what we need to do is put a wrapper around all of this where we bring our BI artifacts together and so people can access it all in the one place. So that's, um, that'll be a major project. Um, the other thing that we're starting to do is bring Alteryx in to integrate the data. So. Uh, I'll show you the, uh, the next slide is that um, table that I had with all the numbers of course performance. You know, uh, we've sort of given up on the mythical world where everything's in the data warehouse and you just have one source. So, you, you know, there are always going to be other things that you want to integrate into your data set. So you'll see th to get to that point with that course performance thing, there's lots and lots of data that we're integrating from various sources. Um, including external data sources, which you're never going to get around. So uh, that used to be all managed in Access. So our analyst just spent, it took him a month to kind of get all the data prepared and get it the right grain and get it all set up so that we could present it in the format. Um, about a month ago, uh, we bought Alteryx and started giving it to our analysts. And um, so it now takes him an hour to get that data sorted out. So I'll show you his, uh, that's what it looks like to get the data together for that uh, course performance dashboard. So now at least he can say, because with access you couldn't visualize the process, right? So now he can, when he says, it's no, really, it's complicated, we all believe him. Um, whereas before we said, come on, Brian, what's taking so long? Um, yeah, so that's the, um, a slide. So before I go into the demo mode, does anyone have any questions? Or? Uh, so University of Washington, uh, Bart Features Act. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more a little bit about who reviews these dashboards? So your audience. Yeah. Who are these people? Is it just your uh, supervisor, or is it a wider audience? And, and, uh, so who uses them, or who kind of reviews them? Who views them. Oh, who views them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah no, we have. Um, our main user base, I would say, is the 70 to 80 directors of academic program that are out there in the university. So that's a new role, a relatively new role, where we've said to this group of academic staff, um, you have kind of responsibility for managing this course in, in a business-like manner, manage it like a product. And so they've got the nail in the shoe, so to speak, for that. So they, that course performance thing, uh, is a well-established business process that they have responsibility for. So what we've done is embed Tableau in that business process. So they use it for that. We have other stakeholders that, um, that use it. So the um, comment stuff, survey comment stuff that we've been doing, we have a committee that's responsible for managing the student experience. And um, they, uh, you know, the chair of that committee used to print out all the survey comments, like an A3 folder this big, and take them home for the weekend and try to read them in her mind to try to figure out what the themes were or what we could do to help our commencing students. She loves our dashboard, right, because it just brings the themes to the top and she can, so that, that sort of process. So we're trying to, I mean, for us, it's about embedding the use of the product in existing processes and things that people already have to do, but just trying to make those things easier. Well, I have someone who works for me who describes his job as being a professional nagger. 
Um, and so, and he's really, I mean, I think of him as our closing the loop guy. So we have, we have all this data, we have all this stuff, and his job is to go out there and work with people, work with schools, sit down with them. And so he's not a technical person at all, um, but what we do, um, for example, with the annual course report process, which hopefully will become not annual, become more frequent than that, um, is uh, we have a process where every year we go around him and the analysts who designed the, the workbooks, and we, we invite them to come to a room and we sit down and talk them through it. You know, so this is the dashboard, this is how you use it. Um, any questions about the data, which there always are, um, crazy questions. And um, yeah, so it's, that, so it's really, we have a very strong emphasis on customer service and engagement. And because of these campuses, you know, you just all of us, not all of us, but myself and some other people are just road warriors. You know, we're just in the car meeting with deans or deputy deans or directors of academic program every other week, you know. So it, we just believe in that level of engagement to get people into it. Hmm. Are there any other questions? Yeah. How do you hold your comments from students? Is it a manual process or do we have a, some magic to it? Uh, we have a little bit of magic, yeah. Um, it's mainly in the form of a particular staff member who... Uh, no, no, wait, 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 wait. No, it's not what you're thinking. It's not what you're thinking. Um, what we've got is IBM's text analytics. So that... Uh, is what we use to read all the comments and classify them. But what you have to do to get that working is build a dictionary. Um, I'm a linguist by background. I'm incredibly skeptical. I was just saying to know about machines reading and interpreting language properly. And you know, you see a demo, and if you scratch that much beneath the surface, half of it's wrong, right? So if anyone can disagrees with me and wants to show me something that works, I'm very open to seeing it but I've never seen anything that works. So what you have to do, so we've built dictionaries one for each survey, so that, because they have different questions and you're getting different terminology coming through. So this one person that we have who would be lost if you left um, has kind of built these dictionaries for us. And so we update them on a regular basis. We look, we have exception reporting that throws terms that it doesn't know how to classify, and we go through that process and say, well, that phrase or that term would fit into this category. And so, so we just, every survey run, we have a relatively automated process of getting those exception those, uh, terms out and then building them into the dictionary. So we've got two dictionaries, one for our student feedback on the unit of study and one for our course experience questionnaire. So. Um, we, some of those, one of those dictionaries we think is reusable for other similar kinds of surveys, but um, generally we think when we're asked to do text analysis of a survey, you know, it, you'll have to probably build a dictionary for that survey. Any other questions? All right, well, should we get to the fun part? <coughs> yeah, I had a bit of trouble with this before, so hopefully it'll work. That's what happened last time, but I have a backup. So, I'm not sure if it needs to refresh or not. So I'll just um, walk you through this. This is our course performance kind of report. I've got here, um, we've broken it down by school and by level, so undergraduate, postgraduate. So we have, um, this is an undergraduate uh, course report for our School of Humanities and Communication Arts. This is the front page where we've started to get a bit more visual, a bit more exciting um, for, oh, it is going to have to refresh, for our Bachelor of Arts in that uh, school. So these are the, um, uh, the headline metrics where we've, we're looking at sort of load trends, so that's enrollment, students enrolling in the course. Um, our preferences, so that's that preferences data set I told you about, is it going up or down? So this course is, load is going down, preferences is going down, retention is below benchmark, the retention trend is going down. Um, the course experience satisfaction is above benchmark, but it's going down. 
Um, but the units of study, they're OK. So this is a course that's kind of in trouble, right? So, so we would want someone to use this data to tell us what their interventions are going to be to rehabilitate this course. So, and then we've just visualized some of that stuff um, underneath. Um, as we uh, move through, this one is the one that I had the, um, uh, the that I had in the screenshot. So it's just explaining in a way how we got to those red and blue um, indicators on the front. Um, we then look at you know, the demand for the course again, a lot of numbers. Um, we look at the sort of uh, profile, is it domestic students, international students, how many are commencing students, you know, new to the university, how many are continuing on. And then we've got it broken down by campus and some um, graphs and charts for visualization. So that's kind of the um, traditional kind of slightly well, I won't say boring, but it's the sort of traditional metrics that we use for measuring our courses. Um, where we uh, started to innovate really is around this um, student feedback on units. So um, here you can see over time, you know, these are the questions in the survey, and this is um, how we've gone in terms of the percentage of students that indicate uh, their satisfaction in, on those categories with the survey. So. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm not actually, generally speaking, a huge fan of stack charts, but this one, I think, shows quite well how this course is tracking. So you've kind of got a course in trouble, but it doesn't actually seem to be doing that badly on the units of study front. So you might wonder why. I'm not really sure what the answer is. I haven't really gone through this story in preparation, so we'll see. Oh, look, there we go. Hmm, what are we doing here? Assessment feedback, question five. That was 2010 had a massive improvement in um, assessment feedback for this course, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that. I want to get to the comment stuff because that's the bit that's more interesting. Um, more sort of heat maps around uh, sort of by unit and by question. Um, so that's that. So this is. Um, this is one of those things too, I mean, my approach to rolling out Tableau has been, I don't know, take it, take it easy, take a softly, softly sort of approach and build it from the ground up. So one of the things that keeps happening is I'll um, come up with a design and I think, oh, this is really cool, you know, and I'll stitch together data from whatever I can lay my hands on and come up with something that I think will be really useful. And I'll show it to the team and I say, oh, really? We don't need to do that. And then about 12 months later, they'll say, oh, where's that thing that you did? We really need to make that happen. So, so this is one of those things. I sort of came up with the design for this a couple of years ago, and it's just taken time for our analysts and other people to go, you know what, I actually think that would be the way to go. So, so this is an example. Um, we're looking here at our Bachelor of Arts. We've got comments around course and unit of study, the learning. So we've got 98 to 58 positive to negative comments on learning, so that's kind of good. But sort of the other way around the study classes. So if we were to sort of try to drill down on some of that, um, what we've got there is comments on tutorials, comments on lectures, group work, etc. So if we wanted to find out what students are saying about tutorials, um, we just click there. So to even split best aspects and needs improvement, so here we could actually start reading what they're saying. So if you wanted to look at needs improvement in this particular course, what have we got? A lot more time needs to be stent, spent on grammar as it felt rushed and there is a lot to learn. More time spent in lectures and tutorials on this, right? So if you're the director of academic program of this course, and you want to know what needs to be improved in your tutorials in this course, you have sort of pretty ready access to what students are saying uh, around your course. So this particular uh, visualization has been one of the things that's kind of really launched um, Tableau adoption because the um, access to the survey stuff was just incredibly difficult and lots of people wanted it. We also have that thing where um, 
directors of academic program would say, yeah, look, it's all very well to get feedback on student administration and student services, but there's nothing I can do about that. Right? So you need to be telling the uh, student services people about that or the IT department about that. So having it in this kind of format has allowed us to then roll out these dashboards to the CIO and to his team as well. So they started accessing this to think about how to um, design the back end of the university. Um, we have a very we ha so yeah, we have a very similar um, process for reporting on the uh, commencing student survey. So what I just showed you was what you do at the end, at the start of your um, sorry at the end of your unit of study. This is what you do when you're starting out in the fourth week. We phone every commencing student, so that's eight to 10,000 students, and um, we conduct a survey. So this is one where, this, this is one where, you know, we used to um, do the survey, big expense, you know, eight to 10,000 phone calls, and um, we have our institutional research person analyze the results and uh, write a report. And so, uh, you know, it's the other way around for us. So we start, you know, in March. So in the fourth week of, uh, at the end of March, we would conduct this survey. And by the time that report was written, it was September, right, <laughs> October. So our chance to help our commencing students was lost, completely lost. So what we've, we did two things. One was um, uh, we, st we stopped doing it, um, uh, well, we implemented SPSS data collection so that it all went straight into our data warehouse, all the data, so there was no lag time in terms of turning the data around. And, and then we uh, visualized the results like this in Tableau. So our poor institutional research analyst felt a little bit job threatened for a while there, but now he's figured out if he just learns how to use Tableau, he'll be okay. Um, and, and now this is turned around in the eighth week of that first semester. So from you know, middle of second semester to towards the end of first semester, we've got the results and we've got people looking at it, figuring out how to intervene. We've done a lot of, um, this is an aside really, it's not really a Tableau thing, but we've done a lot of work around predictive analytics for student attrition. And we've um, identified different points at which students leave the university. So we've looked at attrition between semester one and semester two, and attrition between year one and year two. And uh, because we're doing this in semester one, we're also a, a plan for the future is to start correlating this with those risk profiles and start saying, okay, well, um, is it a particular group of students on a particular campus who are at risk of attrition between semesters? Because this would be really relevant for identifying that what their issues are and um, designing intervention strategies. Uh, so there's our um, commencing student survey, and then we also have a course experience survey. So it's all kind of pretty much the same stuff, just using this one, it's now using a different dictionary in the background to classify our courses using the same visual format. So that's our, um, that's the first one. Um, any questions about that one? No? It's all good? All right, so I'm going to have to refresh this one, and we do have some performance issues with this one, so I'll just uh, get it going. Now, this is the uh, cohort tracker, so I'll just demo for you how we're able to break down um, Different. We've had to do a lot of work. And there was a feature um, shown on Tuesday morning that I thought, oh man, that is awesome, which is having these um, reference lines uh, where you can automatically look at the benchmark for the group, for the total group. I don't know if you've had problems doing that, but our, our, to get these little orange dots, which are the UWS sort of uh, reference point for that particular metric, is incredibly painful, but he's managed to do it. Um, so what this enables you to do is to compare the cohort against the UWS average. So the cohort's the blue, the UWS average is the orange dot. And then we've got all these things where you can look at. So we might, for example, look at a particular campus. 
So our Bankstown campus, how does that look compared to um, the total across the university? As I said, we've got some performance issues with this dashboard. Please work. Hmm. It didn't take this long this morning when I tried it. There we go. Okay, so you know immediately you can see we've got some features around our uh, Bankstown campus. So it's a masculine, uh, sorry, it's a um, feminine campus compared to the average. We have um, Arabic speakers, um, and we have sort of a bit more in the medium socioeconomic status kind of background. So that allows us to think about um, uh, how we tackle you know, students on that campus. We can break it down by, um, we can look at individual courses if you wanted to. I'm not really sure why we decided to go with course code rather than description of the course here, but um, I think uh, that's probably something we'll review in the future. We could look at a particular school. So we've got all these centres for research or schools on this particular campus. We could look at a particular school and we can look at a particular semester. So we've got this crazy situation where we've got maybe 21 teaching calendars on the books where different schools teach in different ways in different formats. So you know you might want to see is it summer school, is it first quarter, is it autumn? You know what are you looking at here in terms of what you're trying to analyse? So that's our kind of general demographic breakdown. The thing that we might want to do though is look at how these students are performing um, compared to the UWS average. So what we've done here is said, look, we know that there are some cohorts that people are interested in, right? So you've got your socioeconomic status. That's a really big one for us because of our, uh, the people that we attract, our mission around access. But people want to break it down by gender, uh, whether domestic students or international students, country of birth, language spoken at home. These are the typical kind of requests we get for uh, analysis of student performance. So, so this is just a visualization that shows that. So uh, if we went to our Bankstown campus again, I think we've had to do these filters using parameters rather than filters for some reason. So our analyst has got this thing where he keeps doing filters with parameters rather than filters. <laughs> I can't figure it out, but uh, that's the way he does it. So, yeah, so there we go. We've got some features of our Bankstown campus. <coughs> um, so, and we're looking at this by socioeconomic status, and we're looking at the, you know, the grade distributions around that. So, it's simpler to choose something that has fewer points. So there you can see some features of the uh, Bankstown campus and the student cohorts there. So um, the girls are doing better than the guys. Um, and uh, that's a general feature, I think, across higher education generally. Um, and, but we could look at you know, people who speak uh, Arabic at home or you know, those sorts of things just to see how they're tracking. So that um, is our cohort tracker. So um, I don't think I can demo for you the upload of student IDs, but the idea is it's essentially exactly the same set of visualizations. So if, um, and these, that particular cohort stays with the particular staff member. So that's something we have to think about when that staff member leaves, how we want to keep tracking that cohort. But we've really designed that custom application so that a particular counsellor or a particular person or a particular academic advisor can grab a set of students they want to follow and follow them through and lock it down so that it's um, private and they can just deal with that in their own way. And um, so that's the, uh, the cohort tracker. Any, any queries about that? No? It's all good? Uh, I have a question about the upload of the custom set of IDs. Can yeah. you talk more about that? Not really. I was hoping somebody would ask me a technical question about the cohort tracker, but yeah. I, I'm not quite sure what, how we built it 
technically, so I can't really answer those questions, but I can um, refer you on to the project manager who managed that. Um, but there was, um, I mean, you know, there's always a lot of, um, I was going to say hot air, but I shouldn't in case I offend someone, around privacy and data. And, you know, to me, um, it, given the industry that we're in, which is, and given the university that I'm in, you know, we're not um, doing this analysis to make money out of our students. That's just not where we're at, right? We're doing all of this to um, enable student success. So the way the legislation works in Australia is if the, if the student could have a reasonable expectation that we would use their data for the purpose for which we're using it, then there's no privacy issue, right? Try and convince anyone of that to actually roll the dice and say, okay, that's what, that's what it says, I'm going to put the data out there. You just can't win that argument. I don't know if you guys have found that same thing, but particularly with academics who are very interested in their ethics research applications and all that sort of deal, it's just too hard. So we've locked a lot of the stuff down, although I don't think we really should or need to, um, but you've just got to kind of roll with what your customers or your customer base in the organisation with where they're at. Um, so, but what, but, uh, what I can tell you about that upload is that each individual staff member, when they log in through the front end that we've designed using some other technology, I'm a Tableau guy, I don't know about these other things, um, when they log in, they get a list of the cohorts that they've created, and they can select the cohort. It might, they might have named it, you know, the um, students who had family crisis 2014, right? And then um, when they click on that, it takes them to this set of visualizations, but just for that set of student IDs. Any other questions about the cohort tracker? All right, so um, moving on to academic planning. So I'm going to refresh this one. Uh, this is the uh, stuff we've had to do around markets, trying to figure out uh, what the demand might be for particular courses at particular locations. So that uh, wonderful data set that I think I'm not wrong in saying American universities might not have access to something that tells them every student preference for every high school lever and every offer made by every university. You might not have access to that, uh, but we do, right? So we want to exploit that. In fact, the University Admission Center, which is the group that um, owns that data set, um, UWS, when they, when they have trouble with their own data, they come and ask us about it because we're the people there's no other university in Australia that sweats the data like we do, right? So we, um, when they, they, we had the situation where some other university came and asked them a question about their data and how to use it, and their answer was, can you go talk to UWS, because I don't know. <laughs> so, so this is um, us sweating the uh, University Admissions Centre data. So this was uh, 2014. This is the Sydney Basin, 37,000 offers made to go to university. We've created a sort of custom groups in Tableau to put these um, courses into competitive groups. So I don't know what it's like here, but in Australia there's this plethora of naming of degrees, right? There are hundreds and hundreds of degree names. And so you've got to figure out who you're competing with in this data set. So we've just sat down with the schools and said, okay, so who are you competing with? And we've created these groups to put all the courses into competitive clusters. So we might want to look, for example, at design and visual arts. So what were the offers made in the Sydney Basin to in the design and visual arts cluster? So that's it, 1,200 offers. UWS 259, so that's what, about a quarter of the market, which is not bad for one university out of five, but um, you know, we tend to, uh, particularly around our campuses, to be a bit better than that. So that's, that's where we're at in design and visual arts. So what we might want to do next, and I'll show you the, um, the visualization for this next, but we might want to ask the question, how many of those offers were made within a 15 kilometer radius of these campuses, because none of our campuses have access to public transport, right? you have to drive and park. So we want to know, students living close to a campus, uh, what were the offers made? So if we look at our Parramatta campus, which is one of 
our easternmost and therefore most populated campuses. We might want to have a look at that. So around our Parramatta campus, we're looking at 96 of the 468 offers in the visual arts space. So um, we're not doing so well there. So this will tell you what the top degrees are. So we've got one degree that's at the top of the tree, 55 offers made, but uh, everyone else has got multiple degrees and making fewer offers into those degrees. So that says something about the, um, the product structure. What we'd see over here is that one university overall is 214 of those 468 offers. So what you'd be thinking here is if we were going to offer a, a visual arts program on the Parramatta campus, that UTS, University of Technology, Sydney, that's where we're going to have to get our students, kind of from them, right? They're the big competition in this space. So we can keep going with this. So I'd, this is done in Tableau 8.0, so no story points. I'm going to go and revise this to, into story mode because these tabs essentially do that. They're taking you deeper and deeper into the story. So here we have a visual representation of those offers made. So this is around our Parramatta campus um, per postcode. So each bubble is a postcode, or actually it's a suburb, I think, which are different things. And that's the spread of offers made in this field of education around our campus. So um, we might want to ask a few more questions about that. So, I mean, just to give you some background, I'll zoom out a bit and I'll show you the campus structure for UWS. So that's it. That's us. Um, we're only visualising at the moment the offers made around our Parramatta campus, but those rings are 5, 10 and 15 kilometres out from a campus location. So if we wanted to have a look at the offers made around our Bankstown campus, we'll just um, do that. And that's the offers made in design and visual arts around our Bankstown campus. Um, if we wanted to look at uh, our poor cousin, the Hawkesbury campus, you'll see there's not a lot happening out there. I mean, the, the dots have changed size, but that's only because it's you know, within the group that the size works, and it's a small group. 27 is the total group. So that's um, sort of getting us thinking about what we're offering, where we're offering it, who we're competing with. So um, I might go back to the Parramatta campus. So then um, I think you know, we're going to keep working the story about design and visual arts around our Parramatta campus. So um, I haven't had time to fix this map up, but um, and I won't zoom out. Or anything. Oh, I might zoom in for you a little bit. Oh, that's out. <coughs> Uh, this was, I just used the pages thing to um, kind of enable someone to quickly flick through what the competition would be around this campus. So this is the offers that UTS is making in this space. Um, if we click there, that's us. That's UTS. That's the University of New South Wales. That's Sydney University and that's the Australian Catholic University. So you can sort of see who's playing in the space, how big they are, and how they're kind of um, competing with us. So I might go back to UTS because we identified earlier that was our big competition in this space. Um, I've, oh, the colour coding is just local government area. It just looked too boring. It doesn't really mean anything. It just looked kind of boring to me having it all as one. So. Um, so if we wanted to sort of understand a bit more about how the UTS is uh, competing for these students, I um, have another visualisation here that is sort of designed to show you the product structure. So you just see um, in this particular space, uh, UTS is our comparator. U that's us, UWS. So we've got three degrees and they've got a range of degrees. So again, if we were to think about offering um, on this campus, the design and art space, we'd have to think about uh, probably broadening our product offerings to attract people into those courses. Ten minutes? Yeah, cool.
heaps of time. Um, so another visualization that just shows you how the product structure of our competitors is designed. And then we go into who are the students who are interested in uh, this particular field. So we've just got some demographic information that compares us with others. So this is classic UWS territory here. So we have, um, in this particular space, design and visual arts around our Parramatta campus, 65% of the people that are going to that are from a high socioeconomic status background. But for us, it's 40%, and 24% from a low, and 9% for the others. So that's this classic UWS territory. So again, I think if we were thinking seriously about moving to this space, we'd have to think about how are we going to do better at attracting people from wealthier families to come and study at UWS. So we'd have to design a very particular product structure. Again, you've got classic UWS territory there. We just don't seem to do a very good job of attracting the ladies to come and study at the University of Western Sydney. And if we were going to move into this space, again, we'd have to think about uh, how we might fix that. Um, we can keep going with the student uh, demographics, um, find out how they went at high school. Uh, uh, we're not too bad here, but the, again, the story for UWS is that we tend to attract students who have lower educational attainment in high school. So um, this isn't unusual for us. There would be no particular product strategy, I uh, think, around this, but we'd have to think about um, you know, the design of the program. We can then look at the high schools that we're attracting students from. This has been quite interesting, not in this particular visualization, but when we looked at engineering, what we found is that um, we only offer engineering at our Penrith campus, which is way out west, wild west. And um, what we found is that the high schools in Penrith didn't send anyone to engineering. They sent them way east, right, uh, the engineering students. So what we've done in response to that is targeted our schools engagement strategy around engineering to look at those schools and talk to them about why they're not. And what, what we've found essentially is that um, guidance counsellors in the school are saying, whatever you do, don't go to UWS. So we've got a big job on our hands to turn that around because there's no reason for that. We're, um, it's a high quality program. All the stats are there to say it's a high quality program. But for some reason, no, they didn't like us. And then we've uh, just visualised further sort of the um, uh, how international this cohort is. So it might be that, um, I mean, it could be that universities are attracting students into this program from overseas. So we might think about international strategy if we were to set this up. So we're getting a lot of students from India. Uh, well, it's not actually a lot, but you, you get the idea. The percentage is mostly from India. So again, you know, we've got academic partners in India. So if we were to go into design and visual arts in our Parramatta campus, we might think about an international strategy around with those partners, trying to think about getting students into the program. And I think we're almost at the end. We are at the end. So that's, um, that's sort of the, the work that we've been doing. Um, happy to take questions or have a discussion. Yeah. Um, I'm from Canada. In our province, we have the same sort of data set. Ah, yeah, all cool. All the offers from all the institutions. Mm. Province. And we've been trying to do some sort of dashboard with it, but because it's an incredibly large file, right. it's taking five minutes to load up the whole table. So do you have a sense of the types of optimizations or any sort of techniques Make it load. It looks like yeah, 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 it loads reasonably quickly. Yeah. Well, uh, what we've done, and it took um, nine months to do this, was um, integrate the University Admissions Centre data set into the data warehouse. So then what we've done is create a materialised view that only has the data points that are relevant for this in it. So that's essentially how we've done it, and that's how we've got the performance. Um, with the um, the maps, no one's asked me about the maps. That's not Tableau maps. Did anyone notice that? Um, so we set up our own web map server um, using an open source platform. We have a GIS genius uh, who doesn't work for me, unfortunately. Works for Capital Works. Um, and uh, so um, what we, and we needed to put those rings 
on, and that just wasn't like, how do we do that in Tableau? We couldn't figure that out. How to put a little point that says, this is your campus, and have those rings around it, and then visualize the data points on top of that. It didn't seem like you could do that using Tableau Maps. So that's kind of why we went down this route. Set up our own web map server. He draws the rings, he puts the points on, and then we've just got layers in the background. So when you, um, in, in Tableau Desktop, you sort of point your, your um, workbook to look at the web map server, it then brings up the various layers behind it so you can have show the campus rings or not, show the suburb boundaries or not, etc. So we're going to keep going down that track to get a bit more flexibility in it. So yeah, that's the web the map thing. Any other queries? Hmm. Hmm. All the time, yeah, all the time. So our main strategy, so with the annual course report thing that I showed, we designed that to fit on an A4 page so they can go in and export to PDF and that's what they like to do. Um, so that was our main strategy around that. So we, you know, there's the format for them to complete their, this is what I'm going to do about it, bit is a Microsoft Word document in A4. And what they like to do is export that to PDF and attach it to their document and submit it. So that's, that was our strategy around that. Although we have started moving away from that. So some of those SFU stuff that I showed you, the comments, that wouldn't work. And so what we say to them is, bad luck. Um, you know, we've done some stuff for you in A4 that you can export to PDF, but the rest you can't. We tend not to use Tableau for paginated, you know, the sort of classical paginated BI reporting. We use Cognos for that. Um, but there's, I mean, the thing about that is you just, you know, we're on a, you're on a maturity journey with the organisation. And if we just don't have users that are going to interact and go to dashboards and you know, there's no, you've got to take them on that journey. So the way we've done that um, is start with, you know, the, what people are used to and then build in things behind that that are more um, interactive, sort of ask a bit more of them. Because, you know, they're also very used to just coming to our office and saying, can you do this analysis for me? And, you know, when you've got 3,000 staff doing that, you tend to become a bottleneck. So we really need to turn that around and start saying, no, you do the analysis, I'll give you the tools. And, People don't like that. People are lazy. They don't want to do it. They want you to send them a report. So that's just a culture change management thing that we're right in the middle of. I don't know if that helps, but that's, yeah. Someone told me once there's a, um, there's a hack out there where you can get a report. So if you've got filters and you want to do a report um, that uh, is a single page for each of the filter options. There's a hack out there that'll do that for you, but uh, I can't remember what it is. But um, yeah. Any other questions? No? All right. Well, we'll call it a wrap. Thanks. Thank